So I've been teaching lifespan development for a really long time and often it is the class that I have the most pushback on the word punishment where you know people will say you should never punish your child and um, I just want to say I'm using this word in a very specific way and it doesn't mean spanking. It is not a euphemism for spanking. Um, punishment is a very specific learning term in psychology. Punish, punishment is when you provide a, an outcome that the learner doesn't like. So for a lot of learners, like my son, when he was 10, he was like, just spank me and get it over with. Like he would have found that much less punishing than whatever I was trying to hatch as my plan for what he had to do, right? Whatever, um, whatever consequence I was going to come up with. Um, so for your learner, you have to figure out what, what outcome they don't want. So let's talk a little bit about punishment and what makes some outcomes ineffective and some outcomes effective in shaping behavior. So ineffective punishment is when, one good example of that is when we inadvertently reward the child with the punishment. I'll give you a great example of exactly the time frame we're talking about when my daughter was two years old. I was pregnant with my second child and I was feverishly trying to write my dissertation because I knew that when this baby, the second baby came, there was no way I was finishing this. So I was at every moment that I possibly could, I was working on this, on this, what turned out to be 150 page, seven experiment report that I was writing. Um, so I was between classes. I, um, at the time I was teaching community college um, and had a two year old pregnant with my second child and writing a dissertation. And then my husband was working full time as a baggage handler. So he was at work. I was home with the two year old. I brought her into my office where back in the olden days, you always had your computer on a table because they were we didn't have laptops back then. And so I was working on my computer and she was very nicely and quietly playing on the floor. And I knew at her age, I had about 15 minutes before she was gonna want some kind of human interaction. So I was typing as fast as I could while she was quietly playing. And uh, I looked over, I, I got to the 15 minute mark. I look over at her and I see that she's still playing nicely. And I thought, oh man, I'm gonna start another paragraph. So I'm, I'm writing as fast as I can. And I was really engaged in it. So she came over, she pulls out the drawer next to me that has all of my data organized by participant. There's like several pages per participant and stuff. It's all super organized. She reaches in there and before I can turn and even notice she's doing it, she's already got a fistful and she was about to pull them out, but luckily she didn't mess them up. I was able to put my hands over it so she couldn't really lift it. And then I you know, got her hand out, shut the drawer and my first thought was, ah, you're ruining everything. But then I thought, this is all me. I mean, I knew I only had 15 minutes and I shouldn't have pushed it, right? So I real quickly inside my head squelched any frustration I was experiencing. And I'm like, hey, do you want to play? And I immediately just left everything the way it was and walked away and engaged with her and tried to ignore completely that she had started to get into my data. Because think if I had reacted with, no, what are you doing? Oh my gosh, don't touch my data. That's horrible, bad girl, bad girl. It wouldn't have punished her. It would have taught her when you've had enough of playing by yourself, go mess with mom's data, <laughs> right? Go mess all those papers up. So I had to act like I didn't even notice that she was in the drawer. I just pulled her hand out of it, shut the drawer, walked her out of there, shut the door so you know she couldn't operate the knobs and uh, told myself, don't push it when you have a toddler in the house. <laughs> so she punished me for sure, because <laughs> she was like, you pushed it, let me punish you. But I didn't try to punish her because I knew that would have inadvertently completely rewarded that behavior. Um, she wanted attention. If it was positive or it was negative attention, she didn't really care. She wanted me to stop what I was doing. And that was a really effective way to get me to stop doing it, what I was doing, wasn't it? And so um, I needed to make sure she didn't use that strategy in the future. Um, Another ineffective way of punishing is that we will ignore those good behaviors like I was talking about in the last video, you know, reinforce whenever you can. Um, but if you ignore those good behaviors and only punish bad behavior, and especially if you punish it harshly, like really flip out, yell, maybe spank them, you know, hold them up by the one arm so you can spank their bottom, you know, all this stuff is like, that's way too harsh. Um, and you haven't given them enough feedback about what is desirable, right? You want to, you want to spend probably 10 times as much of your time reinforcing desirable behavior as you spend punishing undesirable behavior. 
And if you don't ever have children, that's great. Apply this to any pets you might have. If you're going to be a dog mom or a cat mom, um, they do good behaviors and they do bad behaviors also. If you spend most of your time reinforcing your learner, they will have less time to do things that are undesirable and uh, they will know more of what you want from them and not be um, going off into the bad behaviors realm, trying to figure out what you want and what will get your attention and will get you know the kind of feedback that they want. So it's really super important that you, uh, uh, B.F. Skinner, who, who designed the whole you know reinforcement punishment model called operant conditioning, um, he said you should reinforce 10 times for every one punishment. So that's why I'm suggesting you should spend 10 times as much time reinforcing good behavior as you spend punishing bad behavior. You don't want to delay the punishment. You know, don't tell the child, wait till your father comes home or some equally, you know, whoever would come home and, and now that person is going to come in and dole in, out the punishment. Um, the punishment needs to immediately follow the bad behavior. So whatever the punishment is going to be, it needs to happen as quickly after the bad behavior as possible so that the child's brain will make the association between what they were just doing and what they're now enduring. Um, so if you have a two-year-old and they've misbehaved, and so you place them into timeout, you place them there for two minutes, exactly right after the misbehavior happens. So um, if you're gonna adopt a, a naughty mat style or something like that, you need to have multiple naughty mats in a, in a multi-story house, right? Like in my daughter's case, she has a basement and a main floor. If she's gonna use a naughty mat approach, she needs to have a naughty mat in both places so that she doesn't have to climb the stairs carrying a toddler. She needs to be able to immediately put the child on the naughty mat and say, um, you've been placed here because of what you just did. And then they only stay there for one minute per year of age. So if you've got a two-year-old, it's literally two minutes. They sit on the naughty mat for two minutes because otherwise they have no clue what they're doing there by the third minute. They're like, I forgot why I'm even here. I'm a baby. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Um, so one minute per year. And then after it's over, you explain why they, why they got punished uh, so that they can remember why they were placed here in the first place. You don't want to delay like that and say somebody else is going to take care of it. So effective, there are four criteria needs to be the timing needs to be immediately following the misdeed so um, some parents use spanking as a punishment but they delay the timing they're like the child behaved badly in the store so i'm going to spank them when we got home because i didn't want to humiliate them in the store or have cps called on me because i spanked them in a store um, well you've completely lost your chance to discipline your child if you wait until home whether i'm not advocating for spanking i'm just saying you can't delay the timing like that if the child has done something wrong in the store, you have to immediately deal with that misbehavior. So if your child was being allowed to walk rather than ride in the cart, sorry, you lost your freedom, you're now in the cart. If your child is too big to be riding in the cart, um, they need to, you need to have like what we call a mobile naughty mat where you sort of place them right here and you say you are in timeout and you have to sit here for three minutes because of your behavior. Um, you have to do it immediately. And it's horrible in public to do immediate punishment because nobody wants to punish their kids in public. Um, when when I was exactly in that situation when my, my daughter was little, I, I literally just, I was checking out at the grocery store. We were halfway through the order and I said, I'm sorry, I have to go. And I took the toddler and we I put her in the car and she was so stunned. She's like, what just happened? And I said, well, we couldn't stay there because you were misbehaving. And that was enough punishment for her. She never did it again. Like she couldn't believe that we left the store. I came home and my husband was expecting to unload the groceries. He's like, what happened? I go, can you go back to the store and pay for our groceries? Um, I had to leave uh, because nobody wants to do it in public, but something had to happen immediately because of her behavior, right? So that it needs to be immediate. You need to give an explanation to the learner, right? So when I put her in the car seat, I had to say to her, we had to leave because you, you know, you weren't listening to me in the, in the line. She was doing the typical thing that toddlers do and there, she was asking for everything and then started pitching a fit because I wouldn't give it to her. And you know, I, I told her stop and she didn't stop. And I said, okay, well, we gotta go. And uh, she immediately stopped when that happened, but too late, right? And so we had to leave. Um, and I explained to her, you know, when mommy tells you no, it's no. I'll give you an aside, by the way, on that no. You have to say no and stick with it if you say no the first time. Like you can't let them wheedle and cajole. 
Same thing with your dog. If you tell the dog, no, stop begging, and they kind of act like they go to lay down, and then they come back and start begging again, you have to tell them no again. You don't ultimately go, well, I guess I'm done now, you can lick the plate. Like you don't do that because now you've completely reinforced the persistence. And so you don't wanna do that. You wanna explain very clearly and briefly after your immediate reaction, and then you wanna do it every time. You have to be super consistent. So you can't let one, you know, begging at the, at the checkout line or one begging at the dinner table go. You have to every single time react exactly the same way. And here's, a, here's something that a lot of people forget, which is that punishment that's doled out by somebody who the child loves and respects is going to be much more effective than punishment that's doled out by a stranger who doesn't, the child doesn't have an attachment to. Um, one of the things about school punishment is they'll oftentimes bring in the vice principal to dole out the punishment. And the student has no idea who this person is, and they're supposed to feel bad that this person is disciplining them, as opposed to if their teacher disciplines them, um, and they care about what the teacher thinks, right? Um, same thing in the household. You don't wanna say, wait till grandma gets over here, or wait till your father gets home, or something like that. You wanna dole it out and say, you know, I love you, I don't want you to um, have to be disciplined, but you can't do these behaviors, right? So don't do this again mommy said no or whatever and um, it is actually more effective if if you the loved one does it than if you try to get somebody else to do it so you don't have to feel bad so I thought it would be really helpful for you to see how the timeout out technique should be implemented because a lot of parents say that they use timeout and it doesn't work but I think they're doing it incorrectly it's um, it oftentimes becomes a battle of wills um, instead of what it should be, which is just a consequence that allows the child to realize, okay, no, honestly, you stepped over the line. Um, so the, the video clip that I've got for you has a child that is um, more than two to six years old, I think, but um, it works for any age bracket. And uh, so I want you to see how it should be implemented if you're ever considering using a timeout technique. And by the way, you, again, you can use this on your animals. Okay, well, you gotta go in your kennel for a little while. Right. Or um, cat who is misbehaving, you have to go into the into the bathroom for a little while where you'll you'll be contained or whatever. Um, so it, it works on lots of learners, not just human children. So. All right. Well, enjoy this super nanny piece and I'll see you on the other side.